Shane, how are you, mate? Yeah, good, Chris. Are you down under at the minute? Yep, yeah. Um, I live in Sydney, just right on Sydney Harbour there. Nice, right by, um, what's the beach called? The Bondi. Bondi, isn't it? Yeah, of course. How can yeah. I forget that? No, I'm the other side of the harbour, the north side, so uh, more closer to Manly Beach. But literally, I live about 400 metres to the northern side of the Harbour Bridge. Wow. Yes. And uh, did you grow up in that area? Uh, are you sort of like a water, you know, a, sur- a surfing person? So my mum and dad uh, had a house on the northern beaches of uh, Sydney, you know, just uh, on the beach. So I did. I was a little nipper, but I also spent a lot of time out in the bush with my nan and pop. So I would uh, rotate between uh, living on a farm out in the bush to living on the beach with mum and dad. So a bit of the crocodile dundee uh, sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, well, no crocs, lots of kangaroos and uh, lots of snakes and, yeah. What's the deal then? Because when I was in Australia, there was kangaroos being run over like every 100 metres on the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there's actually more kangaroos in Australia now than there was when the first fleet landed. Because of the um, clearance of land and more dams, it's just, and they are a nuisance. Um, on a lot of the army bases, they've given them a, a slow release poison that kind of gives them essentially MS. So when you're driving on an army range, you'll see them hopping like they're drunk. But yeah, there's there's thousands of them. Mm-hmm. And how did you get a first um, taste for things, all things military? Well, so I, as I was saying, I, I grew up with my uh, nan and pop as well, and my pop was uh, World War II, or both of my grandfathers were World War II veterans. My pop, so my mum's dad, he was a 16-year-old uh, infantryman up in Kokoda Track fighting off the Japanese, and my grandfather, so my dad's father, was a signaller with the independent commandos in northern Australia and Timor when the independent commandos were behind Japanese lines, conducting guerrilla, you know, unconventional warfare campaigns. And uh, so I just, um, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a soldier. Um, one of my uncles was in the, uh, the SAS um, from about 79 right through. He did 36 years. So I did Army Cadets. Um, when I was 16, I won Cadet of the Year and met uh, the Duke of Embra. So it's just something that was always ingrained in me. Mm-hmm. And how did you take steps to join? What what was your what was the process? Uh, so back then, as long as you had passes in, uh, you know, just to be a, a general soldier, as long as you had passes in Year Nine Maths and English, uh, yeah, you're in. And uh, so back then, you joined, and then at recruit school they gave you a job. Whereas today. You know, you pretty much get online and you pick the job you want to do and you apply for it and do some uh, aptitude tests. So it can take a lot longer for people to get in now. But me, I, I think I three weeks from signing the dotted line to being at recruit school in 95. And did I get it right? You joined the Navy first? or No, no. So I joined the Army first and then um, I hurt my back. Um, in 97 and went through some rehab and I had a um, the only restriction I had was I couldn't carry a pack over 25 kilos which pretty much ruled me out of combat arms Um, and then my uncle who was in the SAS um, he said mate the Navy clearance divers don't carry packs and they also you know are, are in the special operations environment you could get across and do that so I did. I, I went across from the Army to the Navy in uh, 2000. And then um, as a dive, you've got to have medicals about every six weeks to check you know, your teeth and some other stuff. And I looked at my med docs and it pretty much said I was fit for everything. The restriction had been removed somehow. Mm-hmm. And I said to the doctor, is that correct? And the doctor goes, what? And I said, oh, I've got no restrictions. And the doctor goes, yeah. So I left, booked in to see another doctor to confirm it. And soon as that doctor confirmed that I'd had no restrictions on my med docs, I went straight and service transferred back to the army. Wow. Did you do a lot of diving? Yeah. So um, 
during that service transfer period, I was actually a, a dive instructor at the Army Dive Wing um, uh, on HMAS Penguin and Sydney Harbour, which is how I wound up living where I live. Um, so, yeah, I, um, so I did it both the Navy side of the house initially and then uh, as an instructor in the Army side of the house. Um, it, was, it was some of the, the best, the most physical training, the Navy selection course, the CDAT, um, it's only uh, two weeks, but it's completely different to your, you know, your uh, your army selections where it's you know a lot of pack marching or tabbing and stuff. This is uh, you do a little bit of it, but it's canoeing uh, and stretcher carries, um, you know, canoe to this point and then carry canoes to this uh, reference point. There'll be someone there to give you a code and give you next directions. So it's a combination of um, Teamwork, um, endurance, uh, following instructions. Because one thing they're really trying to test you, uh, the first three days are just flog PT sessions. Uh, you know, you do a, a seven-hour swim across Sydney Harbour at night. You do a 20-kilometre run and stuff. But it's to get you physically tired. And then they constantly will give you information and then try to ask you that information to see how much you retain because – you know, as a diver, you could be underwater doing a, a welding task or uh, doing a mine countermeasures task for a couple of hours, you know, and you're cold. And so they're really trying to see, can you remain focused in arduous conditions? So it's not so much about your army selections where can you carry 40 kilos on your back for 15 kilometres, you know, uh, conduct a, a dynamic assault or a, a, some sort of clearance and then get out, you know, uh, firemen's carrying stuff. It's different. But at the end of the day, they're still trying to test your uh, intestinal fortitude. Will you give up? Can you be clear in, in some sort of chaos? So, um, yeah, so I did all that. And then um, and in that time, that was obviously 9-11. Uh, and uh, the Australians sent uh, some SAS guys to Afghanistan and then Iraq. And that pretty much wound up in 03 when I was going back into the army. So uh, I actually wanted to be a um, loadie for the uh, aviation regiment, the Blackhawks. And while I was waiting for that, I got offered to go to Iraq on a training uh, job, training the new Iraqi commandos. So I did that. And just going back to diving, because as a diver, I'm quite fascinated. Even in the fairly warm waters of Australia, I'm guessing you're still wear a dry suit no 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 no. so um i think i only dived once in my career in a dry suit it was all um double uh, thick wetsuits yeah um yeah so sydney harbour um and that's one thing they really test for in the selection phase so whenever you're surface swimming or doing water pt you're doing it in overalls um, you're only allowed to shower outside in cold water. Um, so they're really trying to um, – and it's something that you can't train yourself how you deal with hypothermia or how your body reacts to, to cold water and cold weather. Um, yeah, so even when you do your night swim, surface swim across to Manly Beach and back, uh, and I did mine in winter, uh, that was just with a wetsuit on, no, no dry suit and – it's a bit like the Bud's philosophy, you know, cold, wet and tired. Mm. Uh, but definitely when you're in a dive team doing, you know, your underwater battle damage stuff, dry suits would be the go in Southern Australia for sure. Yeah, my first dive in, it was about minus, minus seven degrees centigrade oh. land temperature. So it was in February in, in, in an English winter and we had uh, – Really thick neoprene. I, I think it was even thicker than five mil. Uh, it, was, it was like sort of eight, eight mil or something. Yeah. So but, we'll have a seven mil, and then in winter we'll have a, a ten mil overcoat with a hood on. Um, yeah, but I, I did my first initial. It's a weekend screen in Melbourne, so that's near the Bass Strait where it's cold. And you've got to do a day dive, pretty much just go down to four meters, uh, clear your goggles and stuff, just make sure you can be composed. Then they make you do it at night 
pitch black. You put a wet wetsuit on. Um, and I remember, and I was only talking about this the other day, I was so focused on the drills of taking my mask off, putting it on and clearing it, that it scented me. So uh, I wasn't thinking about the cold or what else was going on. I was just focused on that. And, um, and I actually took that with me. Focus on the, what you can control on the task at hand and don't fixate on the environment that's out of your control, I guess. Mm. And how, um, how was Iraq then? So what, which, uh, can I just say, regiment of the army did yep. you join? No, no. So uh, I actually went over um, with, it was a private military contract, but they were all recruited out of um, the reserve commando um, element. Um, and so there was um, about eight of us that went across. Um, and we basically, we were at a place called Anumania, uh, which is about 80k south of Baghdad, near our Kut, which is very relevant to the Brits. Um, there's cemeteries in our court from like 1910 where BP set up. It was the first place that the British actually got oil out of um, Mesopotamia. Um, and it's funny, you'll still see some desert Arabs that are redheaded, you know, that their grand grandfathers, and that would have been English soldiers way back when. Um, so, yeah, we were down there, and at, at first we were the only ones, and um, they had just purged the... Um, the bathification policy, but we still got, but we got, yeah, essentially um, 900 Iraqis that we had to put through a commando course because they were the special police commando brigade. Um, and then they were going to fight in the second battle of Fallujah. Yes, that was, was that the big battle or was that the first the, one? one the, the-, the, the second one, yeah. Yeah, that was one. that was a lot of devastation, wasn't it? Yeah, but it's um, and I was in there for that. It, it's there was a couple of things at play um, geopolitically. So the um, U.S. Army conventional forces were in a rip out uh, just prior to it. So it was the 82nd Airborne were leaving, and the Marines were coming in, and. Um, the Marines had actually been training in America to come in and um, in a more, more of an engagement philosophy, which was a little bit rare for them, but uh, we're going to wear our uniforms. So when we get there, we can re-engage with the local sheikhs as to say, we aren't the previous people. We're all going to clean slate how do we work together. But as they were leaving America and coming into Iraq, that's when the Blackwater um, uh, incident happened in Fallujah where they got the four contractors and killed them and hung them up on the bridge. Uh, so that changed things for what the Marines wanted to do, literally 180 degrees. They were going in. and um, So they had a um, PSYOPs campaign for about three weeks prior to the battle. They built a man camp uh, up at Haditha Dam, which is about 40 k's to the north of Fallujah. And they just said to everyone, you know, at this, this time, we're coming in and if you stay, um, then you're, you're an enemy. And, you know, if you leave, you've got somewhere to stay up there. You've got free food, free medical care. And, and not many people left. And um, I, don't, I think that shocked America. So if you've seen American Sniper, um, that, that is pretty accurate of what Fallujah was like. That They... Um, they just hated man, woman, child. That they were, um, you know. Yes, you had a lot of Al Qaeda uh, remnants, you know, your Al Qaeda in Iraq and Zakawi's group in there. But just the local residents, Shia residents, to their core were very hardlined, and you know that's where ISIS started. And um, yeah, it was um, something that on from both sides, uh, working with the Marines in that kind of conflict. And battle really was like, this is what true warriors look like. But then seeing how committed um, the Iraqis were, you know, you'd be patrolling along and they'd be throwing hot water and hot fat out of windows. And, um, and because everywhere was just rubbish and bricks and stuff, you just didn't know where was an IED. And um, 
but it was also scary how quickly you became accustomed to that chaos, uh, the indirect fire. And, um, yeah, it was, um, I guess, the closest thing that someone could ex- uh, see what World War II would have been like after D-Day. Yeah, and did you say what regiment you were with? Uh, so I went over as a contractor. Um, like working a, on, is that like a private military? Yeah, con- yeah, 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 yeah. So um, it was um, part of the Coalition Military Assistant Training Team project. Um, and then there was CPAT Coalition Police Assistant Training Team. So it started at, as a CPAT contract through Dine Corps, and they were to just train Iraqi police. And then what happened was they changed it to CMAT and they changed the program to um, we were training a commando, um, a new Iraqi commando force essentially in uh, mechanised uh, infantry tactics to, to go in and uh, for that battle. So we um, got recruited because we had, um, you know, infantry and commando and uh, experience in we were just going to train that doctrine into these Iraqi commandos. Hmm. And what what year was this to give us an idea? Uh, so I got to Numenia in August two thousand and four. Two thousand and four. Um, and what uh, what filled in the time between when you arrived in uh, Iraq and when you left as a as a Navy diver? So I actually. Um, had service transferred back to the army and was an army uh, diving instructor at the dive school at HMAS Penguin um, and waiting for my course to start um, in the following year. But then when I got offered, uh, because initially it was only a three month contract uh, just to do this one, uh, you know, they were there for three months to train these 900 Iraqi commandos. and, And that was pretty much it at that stage. Uh, so I just took leave of that pay. Um, but then after a few weeks on the ground, they said, no, this is going to be um, an evolving contract. You're going to train more and more um, uh, recruits. And, and, and I just fell in love with it. So, so I uh, discharged um, over there. And there was a lot of guys that did that too. Mm. Was the money quite high? Uh, so I initially went over... Um, on 600 US a day. But then um, when I got recruited by uh, the US to go on to a US government project, uh, I was on 1,100 a day. That's pretty tempting, isn't it, for, a, for a, an, any person, but particularly yeah. a, young, a youngish man. And back then the tax laws in Australia were, you know, you did, I literally didn't pay any tax. So I was getting $17,000 a fortnight into my account. But, you know, um, I got shot three times and blown up. And so there was no, uh, there was definitely risk and reward. Tell us about that. Uh, so um, how I got my job, where we were at Numenia, we had no life support and literally it was no Iraqi army base. And there were some American contractors that were looking at the um, base security and they didn't have enough guys to run a a convoy to the closest US Army base and fulfill their manning. And we were the same. So we did a deal with them. Uh, We'll supplement the convoy with shooters if that means we can go and get, you know, protein powder or whatever. So we did that. So I was on one of them and we got ambushed and I was outside uh, returning fire and whatever. And one of the guys in the convoy was actually the uh, country security manager. And so he hit me up for a job. Um, And I was like, yeah, 100%, this is what I came here for. Yeah, I didn't really come here to train. I came here to find out what war was about, being a, you know, naive 28-year-old. Anyway, so we, one of the first jobs we had was, and it's, you've got to really understand the context of what was going on in Iraq and America at the time. So this is in Iraq in October 2004, um, they transitioned from the Coalition Provisional Authority to the interim Iraqi government um, and then multinational forces Iraq. So you eff- effectively had a puppet uh, interim Iraqi government that were going to take over 
why the Americans were going to mentor them through their first political process or election process in early 05. But at the same time, George Bush Jr. was running for re-election against John Kerry in America. So you had um, all of uh, Iraq in a curfew between, they couldn't go out between six, uh, 10 at night and 6 in the morning. Um, and then you had a um, George Bush was, one of his election things was, I'm going to withdraw the US troops in Iraq. But what they weren't looking at is how much Iraq was costing. So that's when a lot of contracting exploded. And there's uh, so that, but one of the first things they had to do was um, under the UN mandate, being a mercenary is illegal. So they actually, that's when the terms private security contractor and private military contractor uh, essentially came into being. And they were uh, very uh, delineated. So a private security contractor is someone doing security on a FOB or on a base or a convoy or something. A private military contractor was doing the role of the military. Um, and uh, so what the first contract that I was on is uh, as part of CMAT, um, we were QRF, uh, intelligence, uh, offensive, um, pretty much everything within all CMAT bases. So our Kasich, uh, Taji, uh, Anumania, al Hilla, uh, Baghdad Police Academy, so we had a um, 50 kilometres around each base we were responsible for. So if there were uh, IEDs or indirect fire or um, QRF, we were responsible for dealing with collecting that information. Um, so that, you know, both offensively um, patrolling and so because George Bush wanted to be seen and this started, this is... Um, December, January. So I was in Fallujah in November, most of November, start of December. Then it rolled into this role. Um, and one of the bases we were working at, um, the insurgents had really started hitting um, private military companies on certain roads, leaving Hiller. And so our role was to go down those roads and find out where they're getting ambushed from and who's doing it. So essentially, we're, um, we're the tethered goat. And um, we turned up at this US Marine checkpoint at about 1.30 in the morning on the 23rd of December. And I was the 2IC at that stage, so I'm in the lead vehicle. Um, and, uh, you know, it's winter. So I'm, you know, I turn around and the little picket comes out and he goes, what are you guys doing? And, and I was in a US uniform and then my accent would speak, so that'd usually spin them out. And I, I said, oh, you know, we're heading down this road. We're looking for uh, the engagement points for where the uh, insurgents are engaging uh, uh, contractors and logistics convoys. And they go, well, every time someone drives down the road, about 300 metres, they start getting shot at. And I'm like, all right, that's what we're after. And all the guys that I was with, predominantly American, were like, all right, uh, let, let's get it on. So we had a three-vehicle convoy. Uh, the front and uh, rear vehicle had uh, M60s and the middle vehicle had a PKM. They were F350s uh, tricked up, so sprayed a uh, tan, the same colour of a Humvee, and the roofs had a hole cut in and actually had a Humvee turret put in the top. And the reason we use them and not Humvees is, A, they could go a lot faster. So a Humvee, uh, even on an Iraq uh, freeway, probably get about 110 Ks. And at this time, they were setting up daisy chain 105 IEDs, 12 in a row. So speed was, we wanted speed. So we could get these F-350s up to about 170 Ks. They had a greater range with fuel. And because of the uh, tray on the back, we could carry a lot more uh, ammunition and gear. But in a uh, contact, if we had wounded, you could literally just throw them on the back rather than trying to stuff them in a Humvee. Um, and we had Armox ballistic armor inside the vehicle, and they'd rip the seats up um, and put, you know, uh, ballistic blankets down. And so they're essentially a probably a B4 armored vehicle. Um, anyway, so we, yeah, we start heading down, and I'll never forget it. Uh, we're on nods, and it was like Star Wars. I just saw the tracer, they engaged, 
and me and the driver, we literally just slumped and the rounds come through and then you heard them hit the vehicle um, and the, um, the gunner stopped shooting and then I'm out the window uh, and then I caught one from behind in the back of my plate. It was like being hit with a sledgehammer because what they were doing is they'd engage on one side and then two to 300 metres down the road, they'd engage from the other because they're trying to catch out everyone's, say, shooting to the right and they're hitting you from the left and they would shoot low uh, to try to disable the vehicle because one of the things they were trying to do then is get Western hostages because if you remember, there was that big spike on um, the website used to be called Ogreish where they were um, you know, doing a lot of cutting off the heads and that of contractors in Iraq. So that was one of their plays, disable the vehicle and, uh, and get in and get you like they saw in Fallujah, you know, drag the bodies out. So our TTPs were, if you're on the left side of the vehicle, you, shoot, you, you start shooting left. And yeah, so on this night, 23rd of uh, December at about two in the morning, coming in uh, southern Baghdad, yeah, I got hit from a um, peak aim, so 762 by 54 in the back of my plate. Um, yeah, that was the first time that night. Mm. Was and then, dri- so we, was your driver yeah. dead? No, 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 no. So he um, uh, literally the rounds went between us, and he's just floored it. And he's on the radio, drive through, drive through, drive through. And he was a really, really experienced. He had done uh, the previous year at Fallujah. Uh, he was a Blackwater contractor, so he was really, really, really experienced guy, ex tenth um, uh, group guy. And then, um, so once we got. Uh, the rounds and I've got a photo but literally you just see the strafe up the side of the truck but then um, he's kept driving and then I started returning fire but what had actually happened is the when the rounds went up the gunner hit the deck and just wouldn't get up so when and we couldn't get him on the comms and looked around and he was just lying on the bottom of the truck but obviously we're engaging our targets and you know getting our, um, our gun on and then I got hit and literally got slammed into the, the door. Uh, yeah, it was like being hit with a sledgehammer. It was, yeah. So then kind of regroup, but then we, we, you know, drive through, drive through. We got through that ambush um, and then we pulled into the back part of Bayer, which was uh, called Camp Phoenix, um, which was an um, OGA base and then had to get under lights to check the vehicles and everyone out. Because we still had to get down Route Irish to get back to the green zone. So, um, and at that point, I knew I'd been hit, but didn't know uh, where I was. And, you know, uh, we had a medic who was an um, X-18 Delta, best medics I've ever worked with. Quick, you know, feel, I'm not bleeding, I'm okay, can you breathe yet? Senses, all right. So, and at that stage, Route Irish was the most dangerous road on earth. And that's the road from Baghdad Airport into the green zone. So we got back about maybe 3.30 in the morning and, it wasn't until I was taking everything off that I saw, you know, literally the round missed, um, hit the corner of the plate. So another inch and a half higher or, or wider. And, you know, it's how it didn't penetrate as it was. And I think what we worked out was because I was leaning over, it, it skimmed. So even the fact that it hit and skimmed, um, like, yeah, the, you know, being left and shooting that way, that just that. We, we kind of assess saved me for if I was a bit more upright or a little bit to the um, to the left, it could have skimmed and but that was what we came in our AAR. Um, another guy in the rear vehicle, he uh, copped a um, would have been two direct hits, but the armor saved that and he uh, copped a round in the front plate, so they weren't mucking around. Yes, and um, what about these? Uh, these WMDs, what, what's your views on, on that? Uh, so um, do you think that, say, we in Britain, we, we were under the threat of being kind of annihilated in, I think, in the intelligence that they were putting through the mainstream media, it was, there was a figure, I guess, someone, someone will put this in the comments, but it's like, you're all going to die in your beds in f- 45 minutes, I think it was. That was, so, the, that was the basis on, on what Tony Blair took us into so, that. Yeah, I've got to be, I've got a lot of um, 
prior or pre knowledge now because that was my SME in my later military career. So, but going back to then, I didn't even think about WMD to be honest. Um, we didn't carry um, any mop gear on us. Didn't have rebreathers. None of the military were ca- carrying them. Um, and um, you know, I've done a fair bit of um, research into. Um, obviously, the U.S. government created a, a found a photo of Zakawi in Kandahar at an Al Qaeda base with Osama bin Laden and Zawahiri, and they used that photo to say that um, Zakawi is in the top echelon of Al Qaeda, and at that time he had a um, camp in Bakuba in Iraq. And there was reporting that they were trying to make some crude chemical weapons at that camp. So if you uh, go back to watch the Colin Colin Powell um, presentation at the UN to justify the WMD, that's what he did. And, and, you know, that's when he first mentioned Zakawi. But at that point, Zakawi was no one. And he put him on the map to the point the actual photo they used was and it's uh, Bin Laden, it's in his papers. He's This guy's no one. And they didn't like him because they used to call him the green man because he had a, um, a lot of tattoos and from his time in Jordan. Um, and, yeah, as Zawahiri said, he wasn't pure. So they actually paid him off. And it was the Americans that elevated him to the status that he wound up, wound up getting. Um, but, no, I never, um, I, I never had any threats or got any briefs of uh, WMD. Um, and I know that um, the second target that SEAL Team 6 hit in Iraq in 03 was supposed to be the biggest southern um, chemical weapons site, and it turned out to be a nursery. Yeah. I'm just kind of highlighting that. Uh, uh- but uh, when I went back into Iraq in the counter-ISIS mission in 2014 and 15, Iraq had previously had a nuclear weapons program and did have uh, state-run Republican Guard chemical weapons sites. So um, they were at certain times prior to 2001, they did have state-backed WMD programs. However, um, the world was aware of that prior to 2001 and they weren't active in 2001. But ISIS did try rejuvenating some of those programs when they had the caliphate. Hmm. Do you think like George Bush and his, if we can call them neocons, do you think that they had the, like, the world's best interests <laughs> at heart? When they no, they um, and there's a there's actually some very good documentaries about and books about this now. It was all, um, you know, uh, Dick Cheney and Rumsfeld wanting to finish the business, um, and to a lot of um, points in their favour in some ways. Saddam brought it on himself. If you remember back then, the no fly zones, and he wouldn't let the inspectors in. So he was kind of. Um, baiting them anyway. And I just don't think, I think because he got away with it in 91, I just don't think he thought that they would have ever invaded the way they did. I think he misrepresented the feeling within the Cheney Rumsfeld camp in, you know, but even, and it's quite well, again, well documented now, um, uh, Afghan was, you know, two months old when they were already having meetings about um, pre-invasion plans for Iraq. Are yeah. you familiar with Skull and Bones? Yeah. You mentioned um, George Bush going up against John Kerry, and, of course, they're both bonesmen, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, – yeah, there's a there's – a, there's a, um, I'll never forget because – I'm now fascinated in US politics and I was really naive back then, but because I was essentially working for the US government and the State Department, um, 
And they were really panicking about if Kerry won of how liberal and left he was. And um, he was, John Kerry, um, he was ahead by quite a margin of about two weeks out. And then he gave a press conference where he said that he views the war on drugs to be a greater threat to Americans than terrorism. And about four days later, Osama bin Laden comes out with a recording saying that he's going to continue to attack Americans. And then George Bush wins the election a week later. So they yeah. they were funny, weren't they? Those those Osama videos because he he kind of like looked different in every one. Yeah, there's um, and I think what's put a lot of the conspiracy to bed around that is, um, and it's only just been released the uh, Bin Laden papers where you know it's obviously all the stuff that the seals found in Abbottabad. Um, and uh, a female, I, know, I forget her name, but a female academic who spent years uh, translating them from Arabic to English, and that has just released a book about it. But she talks about um, that they were, you know, his recordings and his thought process. And he was, uh, at the time of his death, he was actively trying to uh, get Al-Qaeda to conduct another sophisticated attack within America. And, um the, the really interesting thing for me was it was actually his daughters that were writing a lot of his messaging towards the end. And that's not um, very common or well known that um, women have such an active role within those Sunni Salafi organizations. Is that the Afghanistan end for him or the American end? Because the intelligence that come out of Afghanistan was that he died in the is it the Tora Bora caves? No, no, no. He the- he 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 died in Nevada, but he. So um, this is a bit of a, a bit of a scoop, and this is a, a true story, and it is online and in um, many places. During the the um, battle of uh, Operation Anaconda Tora Bora, an Australian SAS uh, sniper team had a guy uh, in their sights, tall. A beard, walking stick with a PSD, and they got on the radio for permission to shoot, and they were denied, and they had to give the location. And while they uh, didn't take the shot, and there was no BDA, to, they and I know the uh, sniper very well. He is convinced that they had Osama bin Laden in their sights, and because it they were Australian, they weren't given permission to take the shot. And. Um- yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because of the study that you, the University of Fairbanks, Alaska. Are you familiar yep. with that? The study they did. Not really, no. Uh, Why? We we got to be careful what we say in the podcast because um, because of some of the platforms we we broadcast on. Can we say? Yeah. No, they did a fascinating study into let's just say events in 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 a certain US city that may or may not have been about 20 years ago. I'm not saying yep. anything, yep, but it, yep. it's, I'd encourage anyone to, to kind of have a look at it. Um, because they kind of prove categorically that the, the model of uh, is one particular event actually uh the model that NIST NIST, if I remember right, is it the National Institute of S- Safety and Technology, Science and Tech Science and Technology, Science, I, I, technology I, I, yep. I think. Yeah, they brought a model out after these events, like I say, that may or may not have taken place 20 years ago. And it the the University of Fairbanks, Alaska went, that's just yeah, you know, that. Uh, so, um, so, and so, I do um, uh, in my current consulting role. I do a lot of terrorism lectures and and violent extreme lectures and stuff. And one of the things that fascinates me with nine um, eleven is it was actually Al Qaeda's second attempt. 
And at the trial of their of the of the uh, Al Qaeda operatives that tried uh, blowing the twin towers up first, they drove a truck into the basement full of um, explosives and detonated it. And at that trial, they actually got a structural engineer expert in, and he basically said the only way you can take the towers down is by this way, and that's exactly what they did. So, so yeah, we like I say, we can't talk too uh, much about it, but basically just for the sake of the podcast um, and your position as an analyst, you, you go with the, uh, let's call it the official, the official narrative. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, the reason I'm saying this, Shane, is that's kind of like your bet, that's your, like bl- blueprint, as it were, for where where you are now in your your career. Co- uh, I mean, you're called the terrorist hunter. Yep. And I know every uh, I know so many people just hearing that word are going to say, but one man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. So that's exactly what I do now for a job. Is is uh, pull that apart and literally. Um, I interview convicted uh, violent extremists slash terrorists uh, and write reports on their ideology for um, for court and legal matters. So, and in one of the presentations I do that I'll actually I'll send you after this. That's my third slide. It's exactly that. Is you know, and and the example I use is um, in the nineteen um, late seventies, early eighties, the Mujahideen were our freedom fighters. And in, you know, the 2010s, the, they were our, the Taliban and our terrorists. So, um, I'm, yeah, I'm, um, that's something that on a daily basis that I continue to study unpa- and unpack and reach out to as many um, quote-unquote experts, whether they be practitioners, whether they be military, whether they be sheikhs, whether they be academics, whoever, um, to continue to pull apart and understand that very nuance because until we do um, I'm a firm believer in CV we've got to stop it before it happens we've got to uh, understand what puts a young men or people on a path to want to uh, join those organizations or conduct uh, those sorts of attacks and unless we um, understand um, all of the the bits around it, uh, we're never going to solve that problem. Mm. Are you familiar, Shane, with, for example, Kazarian Mafia? Yeah, briefly. Sabatee and Frankie's cult, this, these kind of... Yeah, yeah I've been to um, some conferences where um, they've discussed that and it's uh, the relevancy between a cult and a terrorist organisation and yeah, ideologies and stuff. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Mujahideen, so ferocious fighters, bloody well worth reading up on. There, there's a great book. It's called The Bear Claw, The Bear Trap. I think it's called The Bear Trap. It's written by an Afghani, if that's the right, <laughs> an Afghanistan person. Yeah. Um, really great. It was all about the fight against the Russians after the, what was it, Russian invasion, occupation. Yep. Um, Special military operation, isn't that what they use? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, let's save that for another day <laughs> or, or later. But um, yeah, th- th- this was such a great, uh, such a great book. Um, it talked an awful lot about Pakistani intelligence What's their uh, abbreviation? Is it the, the ISI? ISI, yeah, that, that's yeah. a big feature in this book. There, there was so much, I'd encourage anyone to read it. There was so much about the psychology of the Mujahideen fighter, why they fought the way they did, you know, why they didn't favor like we'd do, say, troop attacks and, you know, hold the objective and all this kind of, no, they're hit and run, bug out. They had to be prepared to, you know, get an arm shot off and then be put on the back of a mule and transported for 18 days to the nearest hospital. It's just, in, 
you know, this was their mentality. It was like, yeah, you know, so, inshallah, God willing. It was, but that was that was the Russians, and in that war, the U.S. funded the Mujahideen because of the yeah. cold the Cold War scenario. Yeah, and, and then moving on, it flip flopped. If that's the right way, if we can use that expression, yeah. Um, yeah. So, you guys, you guys don't say flip flop. You say thongs, don't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So in two thousand between two thousand and ten and thirteen, you know, I spent pretty much seven months of every year in Afghanistan, and as a um, that was a lot of my job was going out to those villages and understanding the tribal dynamics and understanding um, the threat picture, the enemy picture, um, you know, uh, sources and uh, uh, all sorts of things. And, um, you know, where we were in Aruzgan was, like I, I said, you know, before is where Mullah Omar was born and his family lived in Aruzgan. Uh, Mullah Barada, the, the current military leader of um, the Taliban, is from Aruzgan. And so was Hamid Karzai, who was the president of um, Afghanistan at the time. So the tribal dynamics um, were really fascinating. And, you know, essentially it was the center of gravity for, the, for where the Taliban started. So a lot of the, um, the the village elders and that I spoke to, um, even if they weren't active Taliban fighters, they were Taliban symp- sympathisers. You know, I guess it'd be like talking to a German in Berlin in 1943. You know, they might be a, an infantryman in the in the uh, army, but they're still a member of the Nazi Party. So, um, and a lot of people uh, might realise that the word uh, Talib is actually student. Um, and which is why all their commanders are mullah, which is teachers. So it started as a, a you know, mullah Omar was a religious teacher. And then when this, the Russians left and the civil war uh, really started with inside Afghanistan, his uh, students, his Taliban rose up with weapons and started in Kandahar and breached, you know, into Aruzgan and Helmand and essentially took control of the company. But so that was the evolution and, um, and a lot of places that we went in Shawali Kot and Zabul and Kazaruskan was that rat line that the United States used to use to bring those Stinger missiles and that in, in the um, 80s. And, um, you know, we went into a compound in uh, Langer. And now this is open source and I can send you some photos. But, you know, we found Stinger missiles that were traced back um, in, a, in a compound that was essentially a a Taliban um, logistics node uh, in 2012. And, you know, we, we would find uh, a, an old cave system that was a, an old Mushahadin hospital. And, uh, you know, I was in a village um, up in Chora Valley called Color Color and I was at Ashura. So I'm meeting with the, the village elders and um, one of them told one of the young kids to go and get something. And he'd come back with essentially a, a British 303, a Balazan, from the British Army when they were there in 1898 or something. And he was telling me the story of how that rifle, and he said they came over there with their red coats. And, and me, I love history, so I'm, um, I, I'm just lapping all this history. And, and um, the other thing, I, I worked at a, a – liaised at a place, uh, the Afghan, it was it's called the OCCPU, Officer Coordination Province of Rizgan. And it was the uh, Afghan Army and police and – you know, their intelligence service, NDS and all that. And some of them were Russian trained. And you could see they, um, the colonel, Colonel Baguette, in his uniform, very clean, very um, uh, rigid, very militaristic, was an ex-artillery officer, could go to the board and read a 10-figure grid reference. And I remember talking to him and he goes, oh, no, you know, I went and received training in Moscow in you know, 1979 and, um, but then you also had others. Um, so the chief of police at that stage was a guy named Mctula Khan, who was a local tribal warlord. Um, his intelligence guy, Haji Walijan, was one of my close associates. And he, he would give me the layout. He was 60 years old. And they were old Mujahideen fighters that fought against the Russians. So you essentially had guy Afghans, locals that fought for the Russians and fought against the Russians, now part of the Afghan army fighting the Taliban in the province that they've grown up in. Um, so it's um, 
it was very convoluted when you're pulling it apart. Are they Popozo tribe? Are they Durrani? Are they Hazaran? What is their tribal feud? Um, so uh, there was such a complex operating environment um, that you really had to take two steps back and not get in their way uh, because all Indigenous cultures want to educate orally. And they just want to tell their stories. And um, so, so a lot of people, especially um, one of our major uh, partners in those battle spaces, would start talking or, or uh, over-talk them where I would just, in an hour conversation, there were times I might say 20 words. And, you know, they were talking because a Taran Cot airfield actually started as a Russian airbase. Um, and, you know, the history and the explaining, um, you know, what was that famous saying? You might wear a watch, but we understand time. Mm. We, we've, uh, got, we've got the time. Yeah, yeah. Like, and that's exactly what they did. Um, play the long game. And, and they understand. They would watch our TT. Like, um, our electric countermeasures on, uh, for counter IDs on the vehicles, they didn't understand the technology, but they knew kind of what it did. So you'd see little boys, six, seven years old, with a mobile phone, and they would walk up to vehicles. And as soon as the phone would get scrambled, they put their hand up. And they were learning the, the bubble, how far out of the vehicle. And so they would work out that, okay, so RCIDs don't work in there, but we can make an RC um, com a command wire. So the, uh, the RC part would go to this point, and then there'd be command wire to a pressure plate on the road. And they, they, you know, uh, they worked out how we entered a compound. So they would put pressure plate IEDs in doorways. Um, they watched everything we did. So then we had to watch what we did. And so, you know, I was on part of a, a special operations task group for Australia and we had 20 rotations and every rotation had to change our TTPs because they were watching what we were doing and they were countering their TTPs to catch us out. So then we had to evolve to not get caught out and catch them out. It was such an evolutionary cat and mouse. And then you had to realise they've been doing this since the 70s. Um, and, you know, I don't think that side of the uh, fence, and really it was the uh, US ODA and CIA that taught them a lot of their unconventional warfare. If you watch the movie Charlie Wilson's War, that's a true story. How the CIA and a guy named Mike Vickers, Vickers and, you know, got in there and taught them how to use these weapons and um, how to make them effective and hit and run and, those tactics that you were talking about before. So, um, you know, I think Iraq's the same. Um, not many people would know that uh, America funded Iraq in the Iraq-Iran war because America didn't like Iran. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, I find all that fascinating and that's what really led me down the path of becoming an intelligence analyst. Mm. Um, yeah, because... Um, yeah, we. Yeah, I, just, uh, uh, I don't. I'm not sure if you're aware, but it was Britain that sold Saddam weapons. I think of the uh, chemical variety. Yep. Um, that he used against the Kurds. Yes. Uh, allegedly, I don't know. Allegedly, I wasn't. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't there, and uh, yeah. I don't don't believe mainstream media. But that's that's what. Oh, there's saying. videos of this. Yeah. Well, there's videos of nine eleven as well. <laughs> so um what was i going to say yes so basically got the world's kind of most if i can use the word non-offensively peasant army that are actually like the best soldiers in the world <laughs> and not only that after 50 years of battering the russians battering the coalition forces they've now actually acquired a lot of equipment. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I did. And, yeah. Oh, oh, and why did we go in in the first place? A lot of our viewers would be too young to realize this. We went in because they had uh, the T word training camps. Yeah. Right. Well, what have they got now? They have, they've, they've got all the equipment to go. <laughs> they've, yeah, got, they, they, they've got not just the most high tech fighting equipment now, but that was the stuff that we went in to stop them 
you know, allegedly to stop them having. Um, what a fiasco, eh? War. What, so, is it, what is it good for? But, so, and this is coming out in, uh, in, and it, it's already out in a few books and it's coming out in the, the uh, book that, uh, that's about to be released. In November 2001, the CIA had a meeting with uh, Mullah Omar and he was on the verge of um, making a peace deal with the Americans um, and the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda found out and they actually attacked the meeting, uh, which is the meeting that Hamid Karzai had to be extracted from. So, you know, that was two months into the war, you know, two months after 9-11, the Taliban were looking to for peace terms, um, and so it, it could have been over before it began. Yes, and I wonder who funds Al Qaeda because they certainly had a lot of money in kit, didn't they? All those brand new Toyota pickups. Um, well, coming from it, it, coming from the most impoverished country in the world, or arguably one one of the most, it's there's a lot of unknowns there, Shane, aren't there? Um, I think that it's not so much the unknowns anymore. I just think that people don't want to believe the amount of corruption that went on, the um, agendas that people had the geopolitical agendas, but, you know, even the, the uh, it was an Al Qaeda uh, scientist that started the Pakistani government's nuclear program. Mm. Um, you know, that every time I, I, I say that to some people and they just look at me and go, that's just not true at all. And I go, well, if you Google it, it's on Wikipedia, you know, um, I, I've written papers on the guy, but it was literally a, 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 an Al Qaeda scientist that helped the Pakistani government be create their nuclear state funded program. Mm. So it's um has Australia it, got nukes? No, no, we're we're um we're signed to the nuclear treaty. We're not allowed to we're we're legally and technically not even supposed to understand the um technology into a nuclear bomb. What's the Which, reason behind that then for a um I think the government way back when um, just didn't want to, um, yeah, get involved, even though we're one of the biggest producers of uranium globally. Um, and I think that because of our ANZUS treaty and the Five Eyes and that, we actually don't need it. We've got America and the UK with that. So, um, you know, those partnerships and... Um, you know, like the recent submarine deal where they got rid of the French, they should never have been with the French. But, um, and you know, uh, people saying it's a new alliance. It's not a new alliance. We've had alliances with the UK and the US forever. We always will. Like it's, um, for a start, when you join the Australian Army, you swear allegiance to the Queen. So um, we're always going to be hand in glove with the, the Commonwealth British forces. And we're in lockstep with the US. So um, when the US has got, so many strategic tactical nuclear weapons. In some ways, it's uh, not required for Australia to have them. Um, I'm not suggesting but, yeah. they should, by the way. I, I, I'm just curious as to what, yeah. what how, how that came about. Um, uh, and then I also think um, in uh, just after World War II, there was a lot of nuclear testing done in South Australia by the British government. Um, and the amount of damage to population and there's video again you see it, the detonated nuclear bomb and then they march troops into the blast zone and stuff um uh, that i think that scared the, the government of the day off um but yeah they they signed um a lot of um treaties new treaties that we're not gonna not even have weapons but just not even uh understand it uh, the the technology that goes there but we've got a nuclear reactor for medicine in sydney um and obviously the new submarines we're going to uh purchase uh, are going to be nuclear powered and i'm a big fan of nuclear energy i think that um, we should have you know not that i'm an environmentalist anyway but we should be have um nuclear power 
I just think it's it's easy and especially the amount of rainium we have and uh, it's more sustainable and better for the environment. Yes, that's a, again probably a topic for another day, isn't yeah. it? It's uh, yeah. where do you start with that one? I guess the, I mean, we've, uh, you know, I live in a naval city and we've literally, if you go down to the dockyard, there's rows of nuclear submarines yeah. tied up alongside, like they look like, uh, like bullets in a magazine. Yeah. And they're, it's because the half-life of the uranium or whatever it is they use on these things, and no, folks, I don't pretend I get – I hold my hand up, don't understand much of it, but basically, the, you know, the, the radioactivity of them goes on for so long and so – I, I, yeah. it's almost like I don't think they know what to do with them. Historically, I think some countries just ditch them at the bottom of the sea, and that's – they have done with you know all that toxic waste just just fills our sea so i'm just saying i guess there's dip, you know there's um different views on all these sorts of things um yeah yeah and i guess we could really go down some rabbit holes talking about um mm. uh the global warming challenges and stuff um which i'd like to keep my or out of some of that hypocrisy but I just think um, from a sustainability and, and uh, technology, current technology perspective, I just think um, nuclear energy is much more beneficial than coal fire and um, other forms. Yeah, I've kind of got this theory that we've got to devolve perhaps. We've got to go back to bushcraft, you know, the second you start taking iron ore or tin ore out of a rock, that's when it all went wrong. <laughs> Cause, well, uh, cause it's the stuff you couldn't put back, isn't it? It's a whole of, you know, uh, there's a lot of Northern Australia that's being mined for that exact thing. Mm -hmm. It's such um, a, such a, it's Australia. It's the continent. It's the largest continent, lar largest Island and largest correct. country. Is that, I think I'm, I don't think it's the largest country, but I think it's, it's definitely the largest island and it's the only continent with a single country. But I think Russia might, well, if you maybe turn around a little, I think Russia's bigger. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but we're the biggest island and we're also, I think, the only continent with one country. Yeah. Incredible. And it's uh, what an incredible country you have. It's so, they call it God's country, don't they? Yes, they do. It's uh, the biggest thing you find when you leave Australia, and especially like I, um, you know, you go to Europe and you you drive two hours and you're going through two or three countries where that's, you know, you, you drive through just one state in Australia and it can take you two days. Just how vast. And you got to remember, unlike America and uh, England, there is nothing in the middle of Australia but dirt. Mm. So most of our population lives down the east coast and you've probably got, you know, three-fifths on the east coast and uh, one-fifth on the west coast and the other fifth spread out in the middle. And, um, yeah, it's just uh, crocodiles, cows and uh, kangaroos. And really good neighbours. Well, not anymore. They just shot the last episode. You guys didn't want it anymore. Harold Bishop is gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Channel 4 in UK didn't want to renew anymore. And so they've literally just shot the last episode at Ayers in August, I think they were saying. Yeah. Maybe this is over. I had heard through the grapevine that that, uh, that uh, my days of habitually watching uh, Neighbours, I think, ended about 1987, just before, <laughs> just before I joined the Marines, funny enough. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, and then the other one was Home and Away. Shane, tell us, um, so can you give us a sort of synopsis of what, what you're doing now? How, how I know you're advising a lot of people on a lot of things. Yeah, so um, uh, like I said, in the last, um, pretty much from 2010 to 16, I was um, 
predominantly focused on um, the Middle East uh, as a lead uh, intelligence analyst. So, you know, I went back into Iraq in uh, 14 as uh, for the counter ISIS mission. But also, you know, I do a lot of interviewing of, um, you know, prisoners and uh, detainees and locals and stuff. Um, so then as I was transitioning out of um, defence, um, you know, but the body just had enough. I had to have some shoulder surgeries and, and stuff. And uh, one of my old commanding officers uh, was actually the counterterrorism director for the Office of Police in Sydney. And he said that uh, the Department of Justice was just starting a new uh, CVE team. And I'm like, what the hell is CVE? And he goes, countering violent extremism. And I'm like, what's that? And he's like, it's kind of like, before terrorism, and I was like, "Oh, you guys, well, they and but they need a looking for a um, senior intelligence analyst." And I was like, "Oh, yep, you know, and it's a lot of liaising with government agencies and all the stuff that I'd done." So I started there, and um, uh, you know, so it's essentially um, under our legislation. You know, you you have a cohort of or three different cohorts. There's those that have been charged with a terrorism offence. So I would or will interview them to find out uh, do they, like, you know, they might be yelling Alu Akbar, but, you know, do they understand ISIS? Have they the, said the Abaya and, you know, really pull apart their understanding of um, terrorism and, and, and that uh, and some mental health aspects? Then there's those that have been convicted of a... Um, of a terrorism-related offence and a, a due for sentencing. And so my interview might be around rehabilitation. You know, how deeply entrenched are they in a in the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda's ideology? And uh, if so, recommend, you know, they might need some uh, a, a shake to come in once a week and talk with them or, uh, you know, really what got them um, into that path of violent extremism. So... And I worked a lot with juveniles. So, you know, what made this 16-year-old start getting online and uh, downloading uh, ISIS clips? Uh, for, uh, and then the third one is um, we have a scheme in Australia called continued detention where, you know, you might have been convicted of a terrorism-related offence and been given eight years and you've served that and your parole period's up. But uh I might get asked uh, to conduct an assessment to determine whether that person still has those, uh, hold that ideology. And then, you know, my report will go to the Minister for Home Affairs who, if uh, he or she deems that they're still a threat, will then petition to the Supreme Court um, to uh, make a continued detention order so that person stays uh, in jail, essentially. And um, so then there's more... Um, intervention training and courses done and that gets reviewed every year for three years and then they go back before the judge to see um, if they still have this audio uh, that they still believes because the government obviously doesn't want to um, release an offender who um, you know just because they did 10 years in jail they're still hardcore jihadi and as soon as they get out they're going to conduct it uh, will try to conduct a terrorism operation so so that's kind of what i do now and um um, you know, and I do some other consulting and some uh, some podcasts. I'll speak to some academics, journalists about terrorism and you know Al Qaeda and the evolution of where we're at. Uh, there's a lot of Australian women and children in the uh, camps in Syria, um, so I'm uh, doing some work in that space to try to uh, determine if they um, are sympathisers or followers of the Islamic State, or if you not, say, and you say Australian home? citizens, Shane. Do you mean yeah. people that have gone over there to fight? So some, yes, some, um, some, mainly the women. So they uh, did they just follow their husband over who fought, or did they travel over and married a, a, a Islamic State fighter, and then they've had a child or children, and so those children, uh, you know, are those children? Australian citizens because their mother's got an Australian passport. Um, and then there's, uh, if you remember uh, last month or maybe the month before, there was the prison attack in Syria where uh, Islamic State were trying to attack and free uh, all those prisoners. The actual uh, detainee who got on the phone and rang people was an Australian, a 17-year-old Australian boy. 
Um, and so, you know, why is he in jail in Syria? Has he been convicted of anything or is he just a juvenile? And so I'm doing a bit of um, uh, work and awareness in that space to both look at the government and NGO side of the house and, uh, you know, with our terrorism legislation, um, you know, have they been assessed to be uh, a sympathiser or uh, loyal to the Islamic State or Al Qaeda or whoever it is. Um, if not, uh, you know, are they just a are they a genuine refugee? And you know, should they be repatriated home? And if so, how does that look? And what intervention work and uh, other work goes into to doing that process? Um, and I'm pretty passionate about that too, to be honest. Seeing things that we've seen in our careers, I don't think that's um, an environment for any kid or young child to be. Um, to be, uh, you know, subject to or be around. So I'm, I'm pretty passionate about that. Um, yeah. So and and it, and another big one is knowledge transfer. You know, I've um, over 20 years of of being in and around the Middle East and violent extreme terrorist groups. I've got a lot of uh, you know knowledge, corporate knowledge, understanding that I want to pass on or pass to the next group of analysts that are, get, that are going to, you know, take, because these groups aren't going anywhere. And, you know, now we're looking at domestic terrorism and because of the internet and uh, telegram and that. In the old days, someone would have to leave Australia or the UK and travel to one of those training camps we spoke about earlier, where these days they just log online like we're doing now and they conduct training and radicalization and and that in their homes. And a lot of that took place during COVID. So, you know, it's working with, um, you know, different NGOs and agencies to how do we combat that? What narratives and what um, counter narratives can we do to to try to bring? And I'm really focused on the youth, bring those youth back into the fold. Yes, I'm a youth worker, so I'm well a qualified youth worker. So I'm all young people are my 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 passion. My, my concern, Shane, would be, I hate to use the term American foreign policy, simply because, as I say, probably on a daily basis on my channel, uh, American politicians do not control American, poli- American foreign policy. Now that we know that it's it's it goes much higher, even higher than the bankers and the the, the maniac trillionaires. Um, so I, I I say that because I love Americans. I think they're the greatest people on earth. I've met, I've had the pleasure of meeting hundreds, especially uh, in, you know traveling and in my time in the forces. And I and I I don't think they're at all. And usually, really humble people. I don't think they're at all to blame for the for the wrongs in the world or the wrongdoings. But I think that they're very badly led by some incredibly evil, greedy people. Yeah. And it, the the reason I say this, Shane, is like if someone and I'm just creating a scenario. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not because it's if a person believes it, you Except know, it's reality. Yes. You know, but if somebody fabricated evidence or at least a good part of it invaded my country, bombed it flat, it was in the Stone Age, but now they've bombed it even more back into the bloody Stone yeah. Age, massacred my family, my 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 children and my partner and my cousins and my you know, also that uh <clears throat> certain people can make an awful lot of uh of uh, money, I I think I'd like to be on their side. So you'd have you'd be having to de, you know, deprogram me, and I, I I don't think that would happen. So so that's literally at the nexus of where my life is at the moment is uh, the self reflection of um, that naive young twenty eight year old that went to Iraq looking for an adventure to falling in love with Iraq and the Middle East and really, really, um, and then, you know, going to Afghanistan and falling in love with the country, the culture, the history of the people. Um, So uh, I 100% 
understand that that take and so a lot of what I do now and I guess that's why I've really um, gone all in on the the CVE because it's to understand that exact problem set. Uh, do you blame that person who is essentially defending their homeland? But at the same time, that doesn't. Um, that's not who the the guys who you know bombed the Arana Grande concert are. That's not who um, the guys that stabbed people. That's not who the Nice attackers were. So, again, that's what I do now is is treat every individual and every case on that individual's basis. You know, um, are they a refugee who came? Like one of the young kids I worked with, he was uh, seventeen. He um, he grew up in in Aldora in Baghdad, which is um, you know, it was uh, reconnected over that because I did a lot of work in, in our Dora in 05 and, you know, every day there were car bombs going off and stuff. So he was a young kid then and then his mum got a job with the UN and got him out of Iraq into Syria. And then as a 12, 13, 14-year-old, he was right in the middle of the Syrian um, uh, Arab rising and then the uh, breakdown of Syria until his mum got a refugee visa to come to Australia. Um, and then, you know, they landed. They didn't speak English at the time. They were given an interpreter for two weeks and pretty much left on their own. Uh, and then he got into some trouble, and that's when I uh, ran into him and started working with him. But, like, how do you blame this kid? Look, look at the, the trauma, the childhood trauma that he experienced, mm. not just once but twice. You know, in Iraq, when Iraq was at its ugliest point in 05, 06, to then going to Syria, to being when Assyria essentially imploded. Um, so that's where my new passion lies, is to not treat him as everyone else is, is or you this or that, is to understand who he is and his journey and then um, assist him with ways to, to, to help him with that trauma and to live a productive life as an adult. So... A lot of the um, the youth and young people that I work with, that's how I approach each individual. Don't, don't take anything that anyone said about them and, and just sit and have those conversations and um, pull apart who, who that person is and their journey, their story, and why they, which, which always leads you to why they've, they've acted the way they've acted or you know, are they after status? Um, are they just trying to fit into a group? Um, you know what are their motivations for for doing that so mm. yeah are you familiar with the concept of of false flag operations yeah yeah and in in your i know what my experience is as a commando but i'm guessing you you, you in fact you you might even have of no doubt you got more experience than me but you mentioned some things there in in, in Europe, Shane, um, I'm not going to say any specific, I can't say specifics because this will be yeah. the last chat that I ever have on the internet. But um, what, in your opinion, if you were to go up to a police officer and shoot them at point blank range with a Kalashnikov in the head, what, what would happen to their body? As in the police officer or the shooter? If, if I was lying on the ground and you came up to me, pointed a clash, was li literally six to 12 inches from this thing, I, I would say, as a, from my experience, that there wouldn't be much left of... Oh, yeah, no, no, of course. You know, that's, there just wouldn't yeah, really yeah. be much left of it. You, no, you... I, I'm thinking smashing pumpkins comes to mind because I've got to be careful what I say. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, only a... I'm only pointing out, mate, that I've, I've watched every single bit of footage I can on some of the things you've mentioned. And we need to be fucking careful when we're being slipped and Mickey. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and obviously uh, a big part of my last role um, – in government was, you know, obviously those organisations have uh, magazines and um, 
was identifying where the, the rubber hits the road. So um, uh, there was one uh, famous incident uh, where some locals in the UK actually built some IEDs and uh, how they learnt that how to do that out of uh, a magazine. And the actual title was, you know, um, how to make a, a bomb in your mum's kitchen. So it was to really pull that apart and, and how viable that was. And like you said, is mm-hmm. was that designed at getting those uh, young uh, kids to do something to the left? So everyone's looking here where their true intention or true uh, motivations to, to the right or who's actually – releasing those perfect English, um, perfect um, directions. You know, we used to break that down to the national, you could tell through the pattern of uh, English and stuff, the nationality of the writer. Was it um, someone who was educated in the West or someone who was educated in the Middle East? And so we did a lot of work in in what you're alluding to of, um, you know, yeah, I did a lot of work in that space, and there's a lot of work being done uh, to understand that. Because one thing that um, ISIS and Al Qaeda did in the around 2007, uh, 08, 09, 010 is really recruit heavily uh, in UK and US universities for. Um, engineers and you know your alauki so you could be very um very fluent in english and and could converse really well to get a message across so you had some genuine true believers like that but then you had others who took advantage of that to get their message out if if um, that makes sense without you, getting into you know too much detail yeah shane in in the uk We've got 42,000, I'm just going to say people of a certain faith, uh, and I'm I'm making no judgment here, folks. I live in paradise, so you make of that what you will. But 42,000 on the the military intelligence watch list. Yeah, yeah, Um, yeah. yeah. 42,000 people. (laughs) That's approximately i believe i'm not that good at maths but we we're talking about two percent of the adult male population uh which is a significant that, that means for every hundred people you see in in sainsbury's or tesco's uh that guy at the meat counter and that guy who's just checking out are both on a government watch list so <laughs> yeah so and as someone it, who really works in that space um, and I guess this is where um, my background helps me where others don't have it. Um, because I've lived in those Middle Eastern countries and, and assimilated really heavily into those cultures and, you know, yeah, their, their ethnicities, um, I don't have an issue with some of being a very devout in their religion. Where the issue is on, from both morally, idealistically, and legally is um, the ability or their use of violence. So if they believe that violence is permitted to further their ideology, that's, my, that's the issue, and that's what we really need to understand. And um, that's not very well articulated across the board. So... Um, a lot of people freak out at what they don't understand. And so a lot of what I do now is educate. You know, um, you know they don't understand what certain festi- festivals are, what certain, you know, uh, religious holidays are outside of their own. And that breeds fear in itself. People fear what they don't know. Mm. Uh, so I think one of the things that I do is actually help educate because that's what I'm all about. Educate. I'm always, you know, one of my favorite sayings is it's not that I don't know something, it's that I haven't learned it yet. And I'm still learning every day and I'm still seeking out people who have some knowledge that I haven't got yet. And I'll ask a thousand questions. And um, But 
that's not the the issue is the violence you know um and and when i'm in correctional facilities and i'm conducting these interviews that's what i'm really focused on what made you think it was okay to use violence uh to get those group or that person or you know um or you know they were whatever well but but why what makes you believe that violence was why couldn't you stand there and um preach and put your um views across verbally rather than physically or violently and um yeah so um is it um, those- have you said this to george bush <laughs> tony yeah. blair um mate uh, uh, so I just wanted to cl- uh, clarify what uh, it sounded like I'm vil- vilifying, you know, a certain community. That's not my point. No, no, no. My, my point was we've got an open door immigration policy in the UK. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If you want to yeah. come here, you just hop in a rubber dinghy across the channel and you literally get put up in a, uh, the, a, a lot of the four star hotels are booked out, Shane, because yeah, they're yeah, for yeah. illegal, illegal immigrants. Right. And I'm, um, I've traveled the world. So I, I, no, we go yeah, the other so way. Pro- we, uh, pro- probably a bit of a, a, a hypocrite, and no, I don't blame anyone for seeking a better life. But the yeah, point, well, I'm point, point I'm making is that forty-two thousand, when certain foreign policy still keeps insisting on on this bombing countries in into you know, yeah, into no, rub- I agree. rubble. It's it's yeah. just you know gonna be a recipe. Uh, you know, a rest, rest. I think yeah, we should start we practicing learned. peace. Is what I, no, I think. What I, I'm I getting agree. at, and and I yeah, and I agree. But um, and I think we have learned. So if you look the way we went into Afghanistan and we went into Iraq, you know, in in uh, 01, 02, 03, 04. But then if you look at the way we dealt with ISIS, it was very low key. It was uh, special operations focused initially. Then it was training teams that was advisor sister company from and i was one of the first um coalition uh, soldiers in a baghdad uh, in 2014 the emphasis from the outset was to train and empower the iraqi uh military and government and so by that way they never had to put 50 60 000, 000 troops in there it was always train and then advice would be one uh, tactical leap behind the Iraqis, but empower them to, you know, um, literally to, to, to do you out of a job. And so I think we've really learned from that, from the mistakes of the past, hopefully, um, to now, and you look in Africa um, and you look in some other countries, we're having greater effect with a tenth of the force because we're actually... You know, what's that expression? Um, catch someone a fish, feed them for a day, teach someone a fish, feed them for life. Because we're spending, and I mean we collectively, um, are spending more of the focus on training the local population at a both at a military, at a criminal, at a security and a governmental level that they're now taking the fight on. Um, we're... You know, I agree where 20 years ago we, we went in uh, tanks, you know, what they call it, the thunder run up to Baghdad and literally leveled it like that, like a bedrock. So I think um, where, where we say the West are learning, but um, as we both know, and, you know, you've just got to look at what's going on in some of the places in the world, um, there's still the evil out there. So um, you, you, why you you don't want to go in and, and shock and awe at the same time you actually can't stand back and do nothing and I think you know that makes sense. Shane, tell us about your book, mate. Uh, yeah, so um, it's when, uh, when does it come out? So unsure because it's uh, just at the print at the uh, all the publications now. Um, hopefully next. Uh, uh, three three months ish um and it's still got a working title because the the working title wasn't um the publishing company weren't that um 
enthusiastic about it. So we're still. Can you tell uh, us what that was? Or uh, well, so I I left it as um, uh, we should have known better, but that didn't get a start. <laughs> uh, but it's it's. Um, yeah, because the flavour of the book is basically it's uh, mine and a few other guys' journeys from 9-11 right through to um, what the war in Afghanistan cost us, you know, from mental health and broken marriages and stuff and um, underpinned by political decisions uh, from both senior military leaders and senior government and who do we hold accountable for those decisions in the long run and, um, you know, uh, you, you know, you, for example, you join the army, you go to recruit school for three months and then you go and do the infantry training and, you know, you do selection courses and you do all this uh, high-speed training. That might take three or four years to then go to war and essentially you get discharged at the wave of a pen. They don't train you to come back in a civilian life. They don't uh, take um, take the time to, to do that and who whose fault is that and um, while they're blaming soldiers for things that may or may not have happened in the fog of war, what about the politicians and the senior leaders that um, that got us there or made those decisions? Uh, where is their accountability? So mm. um, that's kind of the gist of the book. From There's a lot of books being written uh, looking at, say, politics and a lot of ex-soldiers writing their memoirs, and this is um, putting them both together, going... And the interviews were, you know, interviewing former prime minister saying, if you could speak to that soldier who did six trips and, you know, has had a failed marriage and has been to a mental health facility, what would you say to him? And, and you know, if you knew how that was going to end, would have you altered your decisions at the start and things like that. So it's... Um, so Shane, just, just um, for our friends watching, because obviously this podcast will be up hopefully forever. What, what do you think the title will be so they can... Yeah. Um, so I, hey, I have no idea to be honest, but I um, will actually get you that information after this. Yeah, yeah, no problem. And just one last thing, because we didn't talk about this, but there was a big uproar, wasn't there, internationally after the videos of the um, Australian special yep. forces in particular the SAS yep. came out and some of the behavior yep. um again i don't judge it war is horrible folks if you think like there's rules in this then you yes there are to it to a point but to think that it always stays within those rules i think is a little bit naive um you know when you've got young men and they've had it just going to say put into them that this is the enemy and, and you're taking hits and your buddies are going home in body bags. It just, and I'm making no, <laughs> yeah, it changes the situation. It changes the situation. And we all have the propensity t for extreme acts. And I think we saw in some of those videos, some stuff that was just, um, you know, ratifies what I've just said. What was the the reaction in Australia? So, um, uh, I guess uh, up front, you know that that was uh, I was uh, deployed as part of that organisation during those times. Um, so I'm um, very familiar with it. Um, every Five Eyes soft. The US, the UK, the the New Zealand, everyone's kind of been through a similar thing, and I think that anyone can manipulate a video um, for it to show what they want with a bit of clickbait. Um, there, for example, the Chappelle process is pretty um, um, complex as far as a lot of people can't understand or don't understand that within the rules of engagement and laws of armed combat, if the insurgent was on the JAPEL, so the Joint Priority Effects List, um, they were, um, uh, you know, they could be uh, shot. And, and that's essentially what a lot of some of those operations were. Um, with some of those videos, what you don't see is in Afghanistan, you would have a very sophisticated spotter network. So they would have 
guys uh, at elevated positions with ICOM radios, and they would essentially be battlefield tracking both um, uh, convention or uh, coalition forces and their guys. So they would say, you know, they'd be on the radio saying three Quetelof going around this way, and then they would move one of their PKM teams into a position in order to engage them. So under the rules of engagement, those spotters were fair targets. Um, and what you don't see in some of those videos is, um, you know, a handheld radio is the size of a phone and they may have dropped it in the dirt. Uh, and that 30-second clip that um, someone leaked to the media because they've been disgruntled for whatever reason, um, doesn't show the two-hour lead up to that point. Mm. Um, I'll say in, and now it's come out and it's in an open forum um, uh, that there's a lot of jealousy to some of the Australian context, which sounds absurd, but um, there's some around honours and awards who got what medals at what time. Um, and um, there's some journalists with some access to grind. They, you know, there's, um, um, but what hurt me and it, it cost me uh, personally uh, relationships uh, um, with my family and stuff was when the prime minister come out and called us all war criminals before an investigation or uh, charges have been laid, it, you know, instead of coming out saying, right, I've been giving this report, um, we're going to uh, do a thorough investigation. And at that point, uh, if any charges will be laid, need to be laid against individuals, we'll do that. He just blanketly called, you know, the 700 of us who deployed or as part of an SOTG war criminals. And uh, we got given a uh, unit accommodation medal and they wanted to strip the whole mm. ro 20 rotations of that medal where, you know, um, some of the guys who died, their families came out and said, well, my son's buried with his. He can dig his grave up and take it off him. So um, it, it, it should have been handled um, a lot better by uh, our former prime minister and our chief of army because, you know, I've had a lot of friends that have uh, suffered a lot of mental health issues because, and it happened to me, you know, daddy, are you a murderer? Daddy, are you a war criminal? Um mm. You know, I haven't been charged with a crime. I haven't been before a court. But the Prime Minister of the country just came out in a news conference and said I was a war criminal. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, but on the balance, um, we also have to point out that these things do happen and that's, you know, uh, there's, there's otherwise it sounds like every every service person is an angel and like I, I i never met an angel in my time i met no i, I agree and um there's um yeah, i think everyone who's been a combat has done or seen something that you know combat by nature questions your own um mm. morality but at the same time there is a legal process there are rules of engagement there is laws of armed conflict mm. and if there's an allegation made against me you any soldier in any conflict zone you should be given the right for that allegation to be served upon you and you uh, be preserved innocent until found guilty and uh, given your day in court. Um, and in our context, that hasn't happened. It was just a blanket. Everyone's guilty. We're going to take medals off you. Um, and yeah, uh, anyone who served as part of that organization in Afghanistan is a war criminal. Hmm. Now, if down the track if the uh, these investigators do find that some of those guys did commit war crimes well then um so be it you know but at least be g given that allegation to that individual um if even you know no matter who it is but but at least be given that allegation you have been uh, it's been alleged that you did this at this time and date and then you know you can either plead guilty or not guilty and have a day in court and you know what I mean? Let it let due process play out, and I know in our case that hasn't happened. Mm. Um, yeah. Yes, my God, almost um, hung out to dry. I suppose is the expression. Like, like you know, like I said, the Prime Minister of Australia at a, a former Prime Minister of Australia at a news conference that went live on all uh, news channels, literally 
anyone who served in Afghanistan as part of the Special Operations Task Group is a war criminal. These politicians, oh, mate, my God. Have you seen the one they got in New Zealand? Bloody hell. She's here at the moment. They are f- they're yeah. very, very sick people. Very, well, I- very unbalanced, very power crazy, very manipulated. It's... How they I, don't know, see- I don't know why people keep voting, you know, I've never voted in my life. I don't understand why anyone would want this kind of weird class ruling over them. Um, yeah, she destroyed New Zealand with COVID. Like, oh, God. Yes. Ah, let's not go there because. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I was about to say. Shane, listen, mate, I, I really enjoyed this chat. We've covered it. Um, an awful lot of um, stuff that, to be honest, I hadn't thought about for a long time. Like, you know, the, that book I read on Afghanistan, that was uh, um, brought back a lot of, lot of sort of memories. Yeah. Uh, so I wish you the best of luck, certainly with your young people. Uh, quite exciting to have a book out. So um, yeah, I'll be in touch with that. Yeah. Is, release, is it, release date and title. Yeah. Is that your first book? Yeah. 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 Oh, you want It'd be my introduction to the literally world and um, yeah. yeah. If you want to make a go of it, write another book very, very quickly after it and then write another one. That's how you have to do this. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's it. it, it. It's, it's about, um, especially in the current context with what we we're just discussing. It's also about dipping your toe in, but um, especially when you've, uh, you know, lived a lot of your career behind the green door, it's, it's, what you can say, and as things started, it's, you know, now it's been ten years, and things have been declassified. I'm a bit more free to talk about my experiences in the war and terror. Matt, wish you all the best with it. Thank you to our friends at home. Big love to you all, as always. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Bought the T-shirt podcast. Shane and I have covered a lot of areas. Um, Sometimes I, I, my personal take on life, we got council culture now, haven't we? And we get this on the podcast, Shane. We get people, you know, uh, w- w- people like literally write to me because I, you know, we're a podcast. We welcome all guests. You know, I, I think that's yeah. how you learn about life. It's how you learn about perspectives and, and, and motivations and this kind of stuff. So I, I just want to say, guys, you know, don't, be throwing the baby out with the bath water with, with all this council culture. Um, sometimes you have to listen to stuff that you maybe don't agree with, or you don't particularly like in order to formulate your own balanced yeah. opinion going forward in life. So Correct. having said that, I'll say thank you to Shane again. And if you could like, and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Take care, Chris. You too, mate.